to the Unlucky Frog Gaming Podcast. You are joined by your two usual hosts here. We've got Tom Mannering in Hello. the house. How are you doing? I am fine. How are you? Good, good. And yeah, myself, Josh Hartley. Uh, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. Um, packing is underway. Uh, I was saying just before we hit record that it's going to be a little shorter episode, this one, guys, uh, because I need to edit this uh, while I'm moving house. So uh, this is probably getting notes to... Um, editor josh uh keep going just just get it done like i mean you're on you're less than a minute into the footage so if you're thinking of quitting it now you don't do that why would you do that um and on that but, note uh let's bring today's uh episode to a close yeah <laughs> good job good job yeah uh, no uh this is probably getting edited on the train as i'm, <laughs> I'm heading down uh, south so I'm sure uh, that's what our listeners want, a blow-by-blow blow account of, of how you, you do the post-production and, uh, you know, a little pep talk from you to you. That's really, really bringing them in. I, I've i never done a, we've never done a making of, uh, but it wouldn't be very interesting. That's probably just, why we've never done it. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Moving on. What have you been up to, Tom? What have I been up to? Um, I'm trying to think. So, at the weekend I saw you. Uh, yes, I was going to say I was at your house on Sunday, yeah, uh, so. so that was alright, I suppose. Uh, wow! <laughs> wow! No, so so on Sunday, uh, you came over to uh, my abode, uh, and we played some Magic: The Gathering. Yeah, we were going to have Ryan join us as well, so that we could get some uh, three-player commander on the go, but uh, sadly, he could not make it. No, nope, um, but I mean, we did. We got a couple of uh, normal games in. They did not go well, and I got very angry. Uh, and <laughs> uh, right, so I'm um, this. I'm gonna blame this on me, but not because of my play style, because that's just the game. Uh, yeah, it's okay. this is. Um, I I basically brought a gun to a knife fight. Um, I did not appreciate because we were using pre-constructed decks mm -hmm. right and i was using the goblins from murfolk versus goblins and you were using a teferi deck yeah um but it's like one of the old intro decks which uh if, if you've been playing magic the gathering and if you remember those are not very good <laughs> so it's okay i mean it's not it's not amazing but it's functional but mm. the, the criticism i leveled at you and i do stand by it is that you basically just beat me down. Like, you wouldn't let me have anything. Like, I was like, oh, I've got a toy I can play with. And you, like, took it no. out of my hands and smashed it on the ground <laughs> through the sh shards of it into my eyes. Like, that's that's wow. where we kind of sat. Jeez, oh. That's how it felt. That is yeah. that is very much how it felt. And, and yeah, there is certainly an argument to be made that, you know, you're just playing the game. And, and you were just playing the game. You were just playing it in a, a very brutally efficient no fun for you uh kind of way however that being said um outside of that we did then play a couple of 1v1 commander games which i enjoyed a lot more largely because i won them <laughs> <laughs> but no i did enjoy them a lot more and they yeah, were well, they were uh, so we were using the precon commander decks for adventures in the forgotten realms yeah. and um so that made for a better experience. One, because they are designed to be played against each other. So the deck mm. construction in general is a lot more balanced. Yeah. Uh, but two, we, it, both of our decks were doing pretty sweet things as well. You got the um, Esper Dungeoneering deck, basically, mm -hmm. I'm going to call it, um, which cares a lot about the graveyard and getting value from that, which mm -hmm. was uh, pretty fun to see pop off. Um, and I was playing the Bant um equipment and auras deck so i was um is voltroning uh, is the the term i was uh, trying to suit up my commander or any other creature for that matter as much as possible to yeah. to beat face like um, i think I, I i was really scared of your deck um when i saw what your commander could do and, and i i thought at, at, at the opening i thought your commander was a lot stronger than mine uh, both statistically and ability wise 
Um, and I think your first game you were just very unlucky. You didn't get your third colour that you needed, uh, which really kind of hampered your ability to do anything. Yeah, I mean, we can we can call it luck. I probably I, I probably kept a hand that I shouldn't have kept. Mm. Like, so Maybe. this is a bad decision on my part. But it wasn't like, it, it wasn't an unkeepable hand. It was just lacking in <laughs> colours. Yes. And I mean, the, the second game, you were you were beating me down for, for the first mm. half of it. And then I got very lucky and I pulled uh, a card that gave me control of one of your uh, characters, which I then used to destroy one of your other characters. And, and I just built up momentum. But the thing I said to you, during the game was that it, it actually got tricky with that deck to keep track of everything that was triggering and at a point yeah. you were like don't forget to trigger that yeah don't this happens, to trigger that happens that because i had like if i attacked i had like three things that triggered and then if i took something from the graveyard i had like three or four things that triggered and it was it was trying to kind of keep tra- track of of how many things were triggering but it it is a really cool deck and, and both of them are. i mean yours was terrifying you know the the way you pulled equipment out so quickly and and enchantments and just you turn things into beasts mm-hmm. um metaphorically speaking um yeah really really good really yeah um so i'm gonna like I'm, I'm gonna leave the deck be for a while just have this as a because i i i'm quite what what gets called a spiky player um i do like to tune things and be like competitive with Magic the Gathering, so I would, yeah, I, the temptation is there to take the deck and just go, right, let's let's put the real nasty stuff in, but um, no, I will leave it be for now, so that I have something that I can go, right, here's a, here's a pre-constructed deck, this is, if, if, you, if you follow any um, content creators that talk about the commander format for Magic the Gathering, they talk a lot about power level, uh, so these are these decks are typically like a five or a six out of ten right um so it, it means i've got something there that i know will play nice with everyone else at the table it's not going to be either so underpowered that i couldn't possibly keep up but not overpowered whereas if someone someone brought their first commander deck that i'm just going to be slapping them about either yeah. so that makes um, sense yeah i think um it's a really good set though um I, I've I've really enjoyed the Forgotten Realms set, what I've seen of it and played of it so far. Mm-hmm. Um and I'm I'm quite glad it's it's got me back into it. And just before we go off of talking about magic, I've had a bit of a change of heart about something as well. So okay. previously on this this very show, uh I said that I thought putting Lord of the Rings and forty K into magic sets was a bad idea the universe is beyond the thing they're doing i am going to retract that to a degree okay uh, that i th- having seen how well this forgotten realm set has, has integrated at least for the lord of the rings one especially and and maybe even to a degree the 40k one I, i'm being a bit more open-minded about them than i, I previously have been okay so that's okay. that's, that's my progress. my position that's shift. Progress, yeah, yeah. Um, they, they they have done a, a fantastic job of this set uh, in terms of tying in the flavor. I think I said like I said to you, it's not just the flavor of the Forgotten Realms, but the flavor of playing Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Um, it, that and you know getting dice rolling mechanics and stuff like that. It, it's it's great. So it gives me a bit more, like you say, I I agree with you. It gives me a bit more faith with how they're going to treat some of these other IPs. Yeah. What I, uh, there's a rumor going around which I think will be great uh, a great way of sort of making the 40k uh, products less jarring uh, they have uh, registered two domain names uh, I can't remember the, the um, other domain name but Wizards of the Coast have registered it is Kamigawa Neon Dynasty dot com okay. now Kamigawa is uh a notorious set from years ago notorious because it was rubbish it was very underpowered but it's a shame because flavor wise it was awesome this was kamigawa is the plane that is inspired by uh, japanese mythology so it was filled with samurai ninjas uh, spirits that uh, that sort of thing mm-hmm. um now 
what a lot of people are speculating with that name, Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, is that not only are we going to return to Kamigawa, but we are going to return to a Kamigawa that is far in the future from where we'd seen it. Right. So a sort of cyberpunk um, style. So maybe taking taking uh, inspiration from the likes of you know Akira mm. in, and other like Japanese anime. Now, so, oh, sorry, on you go. So what 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 kind of pushed me over the edge was I was I was reading up a little bit on on this magic article and it ties into what you're saying there because I I kind of said you know it's ridiculous having space marines and Aragorn and and all this lot rocking around together mm-hmm. uh, and I still I still hold to that to a degree I, and it is a bit ridiculous but what's kind of pointed the the finger back at me if you will is with magic specific cards without going anywhere outside of the the magic law. There's a quote from one of the the people involved in in magic that's like, mm-hmm. in the current lineup of cards, you can have a Greek god, uh, a mummy, two squirrels, and um, uh, some like a zombie wielding a katana driving around in a car together. And I was like, yeah, ah, uh, yeah, that's a thing you can do. Fair enough. <laughs> that 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 kind of gives me a bit of perspective on on the point i'm making about you know oh it's ridiculous well it's already kind of ridiculous if you uh if you want it to be so uh i think that that's really cool like if if they go down that route and do a a kind of japanese cyberpunk thing um that'd be awesome yeah so watch this space guys and before we move off magic the gathering i just want to quickly shout out i was uh, last night I'm doing like a because I'm moving at the weekend. I'm doing a lot of like catching up with people in Glasgow before I leave. And I once said catch up with some of the guys from uh, Geekaboo, and uh, we drafted. Um, there was six of us drafting Modern Horizons two. I actually treated myself to a box of booster packs of this earlier in the month. So we've drafted half of the packs, and all I have to say is it is super fun. I love the format. I love the format, and uh, I really want to draft more. <laughs> so I'll uh, I'll see who I can uh, conscript into that back home. Well, I think uh, Carlisle has a, a decent magic community. At least it did when I lived there. I don't know if it's. Still... I uh, a few of my friends from uh, school. Uh, I I got into <laughs> playing Magic: The Gathering. I'll be uh, initially with drafting. This was around when Cards of Tarkir came out. Mm-hmm. Um, so shouts out to Chris, Dan, uh, and, and the other guys <laughs> down there. So I might I, I might give them a shout and see if they'd be up for drafting this mental set with me. Um, I don't know how long it's been since they last played though, and it is it is an intense set. I think okay. I'll, I'll say that. But uh, I, I got I, I got some bloody valuable cards. I got two fetch lands in there. I've got a, a few cards that I've been after as well. So that that's always nice icing on the cake. That's um, cool. It would be remiss of me as well not to thank you on air for your leaving present for me as well. Oh, it's uh, fine. You don't need to thank you for that. Well, he, he, Tom, Tom gave me a copy of Land Tax, which is a card I've actually been after for absolutely ages. And uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's pretty expensive for a piece of cardboard, so uh, I, I really appreciated that. <laughs> Very welcome, bud. Uh, on on to your question from back at the beginning. Aside from seeing you and playing, oh, yeah, Magic, damn. <laughs> uh, it's, it's old. This old memory still has a bit mm. of go in it. Um, I have not done a great deal. I, I've had a very busy day today. Um, right. It's been a bit manic. I was at the the hospital this morning nothing nothing major just a, a wee checkup regular uh, checkup yeah i went to uh i went to view a flat uh which i just want to have a, a little not a rant about but a little oh, grumble let's about let's hear it right? was it was it bad how it bad? wasn't uh, it how wasn't bad? bad bad it wasn't like oh my god this is a nightmare but i went right. to it so it's not far from me it's about 20 minutes down the main mm-hmm. road outside of my flat and part of this is on me to be fair because i didn't really look at the flat like location wise or anything before i went to okay. view it which i would normally do but i've been a bit busy and it kind of slipped my mind so i got down to it now in the advert for this flat it said third floor flat now just just to preface that i won't live on a ground floor because your risk of burglary is a lot higher your risk of people peeping in your windows a lot higher 
Um, Just uh, FYI, Tom works in the insurance industry. He does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your risk of suffering from like escape of waters and things like that from the people that are above you also a lot higher. So I won't ever live in a in a ground floor flat. I'm not dissing anyone that does. It's just my personal choice. So this this advert for this flat said third floor. I got there and the guy's like, "Yeah, press uh, zero three and I'm like, "Right, I really hope that's like the zeroth flat on the third floor, which wouldn't exist." So uh, <laughs> that's the main selling point of the flat. It's in a parallel dimension. Yeah, so, so I, it po- I go- it's in a pocket plane. Yeah, I go in and Cthulhu's there, and you know it really brings the property <laughs> value down. Uh, so I, I go in, I'm like, it's ground floor, okay, it's not ideal, but I'll, I'll give it a look around. Mm. So I go through the flat, and, and as I'd come to the flat, I'd come from like a different angle, and as right. I get into the flat, I can hear traffic, and I mean like hear traffic. Not like distant, like there's a car right. in the living room level of traffic. So, like, I right. go into the living room, and it backs onto uh, an A-road. Right. Oh. And I go to the two bedrooms, and both of them back onto the A-road. So, it's on a ground floor. It backs onto an A-road. So, at this point, I'm like, this is pretty much a no-go. But I'll go mm. and I'll finish my look around anyway. So, I go into the kitchen. Now, bear in mind, this is on the market right now to be rented right now, right? You can How much? Move How much? in tomorrow. It's like uh, 650 a month. Yeah. So, as if that wasn't enough of a turn-off, right? So, I go into mm-hmm. the kitchen, and I'm, like, looking around, and, I, again, because I work in insurance, I always look at, like, ceilings and things. Yeah. And I look at the ceiling, and I'm like, oh, there's a bit of, like, a seam there. It looks like there's been a previous escape of water. And I follow mm-hmm. this seam across the kitchen, and, like, a good third of the back of the kitchen is still water damaged, like, oh, brown no. water damage with the paint peeled off. And I'm like... Why? And it's quite a nice flat, with the exception yeah. of that. And I'm like, why have you put this on the market when there's blatant water damage yeah. that even like the casualest of glances up in the corner of the kitchen is gonna clap, gonna clock? Uh, so I went outside, and <laughs> the lighting agent was like, "That was quick." I said, "Yeah, I've seen all I need to see." <laughs> and just, just wow, nice. <laughs> so six hundred and fifty a month for for that. Yeah. Jeez, oh. Yeah, it's uh. And it is a good location, with the exception of being next to an air road. Yeah. You know, it's, it's quite a central. I mean, of course, you're quite central. You're you're not that far from a bloody motorway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's not it's not too bad in that regard. But yeah, I was like, I, I was walking back, and I actually saw the funny side of it. To be honest, I was like, that's just it's just ridiculous kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that's not going to be one. I'll be uh, I'll be renting. Can I can I be the annoying person who uh, has a, a a story from way back when uh, that's a worse example? A story topper, of course. Yeah. You can be a story topper, mate. Uh, when I first, it's I'll, I'll 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 make this brief. When when I first moved up to Glasgow, like back in 2012, I had no idea what the sort of neighbourhoods were like. So I uh, randomly picked some flats that were in a neighbourhood called Govan Hill. Now, uh, for those people, yeah, Tom's just pulled a face on the webcam. Now, people who are not familiar with Glasgow, like I was, didn't know, but Govan Hill is one of the roughest areas of the city, unfortunately. Um, and this particular this particular flat that I viewed, the estate agent says to me, I'm not going to lie, this one's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> was that like their opening comment? Yeah. Uh, oh. So... Um, I'll, I'll I'll bullet point it. Um, the there wasn't a door. Uh, the, like a front was, door. No, no, as in like the door to the flat was on its like it was off its hinges, um, and uh, there was a hole in the wall, and there was straw on the floor. Why why is there straw on the floor? No one knows. Like why why? Was, it, was it added in by a horse <laughs> beforehand? <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, it is interesting what is out there. I just, I don't understand it. Like, and uh, Obviously, I'm not an estate agent. I'm not a landlord, so I, I can't really comment. But if I were an estate agent and someone came to me and said, I want you to rent my property, if I went out there and, you know, there was, well, there was a door hanging off the hinge or, mm. you know, blatant water damage, I'd be like, we're going to need to resolve that first. 
well, rent, let's it's, look at it, renting it. They, they can only advise said landlord what to do. It's it's their call at the end of the day. And if the landlord yeah. is tight and doesn't want to spend any money on it, then they might just think, well, someone's going to be desperate enough to get it. Yeah. I mean, I've seen I've seen people living in some pretty uh, ropey flats, yeah. and I'm like. I have no idea why you accepted this. But. I I had a so we're getting a bit off track, so I'll keep this quick because I know you want a short episode. But when I well, first... I'm giving up. I'm giving up on the short episode. We're 20 minutes in, man. <laughs> <laughs> like we haven't even got to any news articles. But... When I when I first moved back up to Glasgow, or I moved back up to Paisley, I desperately needed a flat. Like mm-hmm. I had nowhere to live, and I was starting work, and I didn't have a flat or anything. So I was staying on a, on the floor at a friend's house. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just went out to a, a letting agent, and I was I basically was quite honest with them. And I went, I've got very limited funds for a deposit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I need a flat, one bedroom, nothing fancy, just something to stay in for six months. Uh, and they're like, we've got just the one for you. And this flat was pretty rough. It was okay. it was it was functional, uh, yeah. but it was it was pretty rough. It hadn't had a lot of TLC, uh, and I got it really cheap. And I got in like the day after I, I went to that letting agent. So it was all nice. very, very quick. Uh, but I paid peanuts for it while I stayed. I actually stayed there longer because of how little I paid for it and because I actually did a bit to like spruce it up. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> I was I was in the shower one day in that flat and I got out of the shower and I went into my bedroom and I just heard this horrible wet thud. And I went back into the bathroom and the shower tray had fallen through the floor into the flat below. Like with oh all the my God. all the problems that come with it. So I'm stood like in a towel, like looking down this <laughs> hall, watching water just kind of <laughs> pissing down into it. And there was this student girl who lived below me who was, was probably equally desperate kind of walked through, still had her headphones on because I think she was listening to music, and kind of looked up at me and I was like, sorry about that. (laughs) Oh my God. The the positive with renting though is you can just go, right, well, landlord, yeah, yeah, this needs fixed. And they came back out and I said, look, I need a shower unit. You know, there's literally no floor in my shower unit. And they came out and they fixed it in like two days, which is quite good to say. That's, they put that's new, really good, actually. New ceiling, new plumbing, new flooring, and new shower unit. But the it's guy the must that have... happened in the first place. Yeah, the guy <laughs> must have done it on the cheap, though, like despite that, because the shower unit they put in, so it's one of these kind of old school Glasgow bathrooms where the bathroom's like literally like a meter and a, a half wide. Mm. And it's all long designed. Yeah. And so you had like you had the, the toilet at the far end of the the bathroom and then you had the shower unit on the left mm-hmm. and the kitchen and the basin on the left not the kitchen on the left that'd be really small uh yes. and so they, they'd gone in and they did not put an appropriately sized shower unit in they put a shower unit in that was about one and a half times the size of the original one so to wow. get to the toilet you had to turn sideways on and shuffle along the wall to get to the toilet and if you sat on the toilet you couldn't put your legs straight forward you had to like sit at kind of a 45 degree angle oh my it, <laughs> oh, Jesus. it was rough it was a really nice shower unit uh other than that you know very spacious uh it was very very comfortable to shower yeah, sh- the, sh- the shower was nice and comfy yeah. shame about the toilet but yeah just you know everything else was was problematic so yeah anyway that's a, a slight uh detraction from from talking about board games and things games uh, yeah that's yeah. what we do that's <laughs> just some um, horror stories for any of you thinking about renting out there i mean uh, i will uh, with with the exception of uh, uh, paying my brother Dick's money, I am I am never going back to renting ever. <laughs> I will be responsible for my own property. Thank you very much. Don't blame you, mate. So the other thing I haven't done it yet, but I will be doing it after recording this. So we're we're recording on Tuesday, so obviously you've mm-hmm. got a time for packing and things. So I'm doing uh, a session of my high level Pathfinder after this recording. Ooh, yeah. Uh, so I'm doing uh, Ages End, and we're up to like the last maybe four five six episodes tops mm-hmm. uh so it's it's tense it's a uh, high level pathfinder which is uh, you know challenging in its own right uh mm-hmm. and and it's that kind of bit of sweet march to the end oh. 
How um, so? You, you say that, that there's about five or six sessions left in it. Max, there be much chat about what's happening with these characters and this arc after. Uh, so stuff? there hasn't been a lot. It's it's kind of accepted that this is probably going to be the end of of the campaign. Um, mm-hmm. The characters will will continue in the crossovers that we do as and when yeah. they get back off the ground. We were hoping to do on this year, but it's been postponed because I have to move. Mm-hmm. Um, so That's fair. Yeah. I'll allow it. Thanks. Uh, so <laughs> we've uh, we'll revisit these characters in the crossover. Uh, beyond that, I I don't know if we'll come back to them. maybe you know for some sort of special or one off uh, at some mm-hmm. point, but. High level Pathfinder presents its own challenges, and you know the higher you get, the more challenging that gets. Um, after this, I think we're going to have one of the players is going to run a uh, a brief arc of a Star Wars game, which will be a nice little break for me to oh, yeah, neat. to get to play some Star Wars. Uh, and then the plan after that is probably going to be I'll go to running the Cthulhu game that's been on indefinite hiatus. Uh, in the Tuesday night slot, but I need to figure out the logistics behind that. Uh, so there's stuff stuff going on. The, the session will definitely continue in in one yeah. format because it's so difficult as an adult adult to schedule games. When you do get people that that commit to a schedule, especially as a GM, you become very precious about it. Yeah, because no, I get that. You know, you know yourself from from having played in in a couple of games you know scheduling is a nightmare at the best of times Mm -hmm. um and and getting that consistent commitment from people is uh, an uphill battle (laughs) to say the least so once you've got that you know you you hold on to it for dear life uh if you've got any smarts yeah well fair enough well we'll uh, look forward to hearing further from that shall we hop on and uh talk some news stuff We've got sure. a big news article came out uh, to just today, the 27th of July. Um, the good times keep rolling for Games Workshop, it, so it seems. Uh, this was reported, I'm going to quote my sources correctly, this was uh, reported in The Guardian, although I dare say it will be in other news outlets. Uh, but um, Games Workshop has uh, released some uh, financial information. Uh, they are con- not only have they been doing well; they have been doing so well that they have uh, they have awarded all of their shop workers, model makers, designers, and support staff a five thousand pound bonus, um, which is great. <laughs> um, we know a couple of people who work in Games Workshop as well, so I dare say I haven't, I haven't caught up with any of them yet, but I dare say they're very very happy yeah i imagine they will be and i I think this is you know it's just a further example we've mentioned this before on the on the podcast that games workshop has has dealt with their employees very well over the last Mm. sort of 18 months through through lockdown uh and beyond you know they've they've had a couple of bonuses you know they paid uh their full wages when they were Mm -hmm. um What's that word where they weren't furloughed. working? Furloughed. Furloughed, thank you. Uh, when they were furloughed uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, a few other uh, bits and bobs where we've seen them behaving in quite commendable ways. And, and I think this is uh, the icing on the cake, really. Uh, you know, it's not often I sit here and call out Games Workshop for, for being awesome, but <laughs> can't argue with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and just to really hammer home, like... Um, how well things are going for them. Uh, the, the article later quotes, uh, they are worth more on the UK stock exchange than Marks and Spencer at the moment, which is like, uh, American listeners, and I know we've got a few American listeners might not know, but Marks and Spencer is a very old, very well established uh, department store uh, throughout the UK, department store and supermarket throughout the UK. Yeah, it's kind of a, a middle class department store historically, and that's what it's yeah. kind of known for. Do you think Games Workshop will start doing their own version of the MS adverts, you know, with the sexy voice? This isn't just a miniature, this is a Games Workshop Primaris Space Marine. <laughs> GW, I mean, if you're listening, 
talk. Let's talk. I can do that for you. I have a lot of respect for you, Josh, contrary to, to what I say on this uh, podcast quite a lot, but you do not have a sexy voice. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. Just hit, hit me where it hurts, man. Hit me where it hurts. Um, funnily enough, this was interesting because it also talks about, and I wasn't aware this was something they were considering. In Japan, they are looking to open uh, Warhammer cafes. Okay. So I'm assuming that's going to be modelled somewhat like Warhammer World and Bugman's Bar hmm. uh, in Nottingham. Um, Maybe. Why did Japan get that? I would love that. Like, go go get a game of Warhammer, have a few pints. That yeah. sounds great. Yeah, it just sounds quite nice. I remember when I when I went for my training at Games Workshop eons ago. Mm. Uh, and I went to what was then called a manager academy. I don't know if it's called that anymore. Um, but I went along, and there was about maybe 12 of us, and there was a guy mm. there, and he was going over. He was getting this training. He was, I think he was an English guy, if memory serves, mm-hmm. um, and he was getting this training, but he was actually going to manage a store in Japan. Wow. Um, which is, I think it was Japan. I'm, Mm. as I say it's a long time ago but I, I seem to remember it was something like that and yeah he was going over to and I was like oh do you speak the language and, and just I remember him going no <laughs> it's like what yep but fair enough I guess yeah <laughs> best, best of luck to you <laughs> yeah good luck with that yeah uh, I'm sure you'll be a great customer service uh, professional yeah <laughs> Well, we've so got anyway. more news from Games Workshop, mm. uh, uh, although that's from The Guardian, technically, but uh, is that the first time we've ever referenced The Guardian on this? Uh, I think it might be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're, co- we're going up in the world. I was going to say, we're classing it up a little bit. Uh, yeah. Normally we refer to, you know, like... Uh, Websites. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Just sun. Websites. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We were a tabloid podcast previously, <laughs> but now... Now we're broadsheets, so there. Classing it up. Okay, so yeah. Games Workshop uh, have announced yesterday uh, that dragons are coming back to the mortal realms forever, apparently. Mm. Uh, it's a broad, that's a very uh, confident statement. Uh, yes. <laughs> but okay. Uh, do you think you could sue them for like false advertising if they don't sell dragons in Age of Sigmar uh, in the uh. future? No idea. I mean, you good. Good luck with you uh, if you want to take on that case, Tom. If if it ever passes. But... To be fair, I think Games Workshop are famously quite uh, legally strong, so I'm not sure they're they're an opponent that. They're also used to getting uh, be, being on the receiving end of wacky lawsuits as That's well. That's also so, true. Like, not so... that that idea was wacky, Tom. But how dare on. you, sir? My <laughs> my legal pedigree is top notch. Uh, yeah. So uh, they're bringing out two new dragon models now these aren't um generic dragons like we've we've seen quite often before Mm. uh these are two named character dragons yeah uh, and they're they're drag draconith so i don't know if there's a a technical difference there because they do say the dragons or draconith uh are back so is there there a little tm next to draconith there is Is not a little tm (laughs) see that was my first thought i was like oh yes legally distinct from normal dragons Mm. reminds me of that scene in uh austin powers where the guy's like it's godzilla we need to run away (laughs) he's like no for legal reasons it's not godzilla yes (laughs) it's very similar to godzilla we should run like it is godzilla (laughs) is that not the chap who plays hero nakamura and i think it is yeah (laughs) random whatever happened to him (laughs) i'm sure he's doing something Uh, you always find that like these these uh actors tend to like if they disappear they crop up in like you know some random u.s sitcom or drama that never really makes it across the sea uh okay so uh we will get to the point of this sooner or later uh (laughs) godzilla and uh legal proceedings notwithstanding so Mm. we've got i'm gonna try and pronounce this grandis i think is is the way it's pronounced grandis yeah he um grandis sorry grandis grandis Krondis, okay. son of Dracothian. <laughs> yes. Uh, so he's quite cool. Uh, mm. Very sort of, I'd say sagely looking, but he's still, you know. He looks like quite he, smug. Yeah. He looks like that guy who's just going, 
oh yeah, I know that band. I liked them before they were cool. <laughs> this <laughs> is the hipster dragon. Yeah, you just give him a little trilby. Yeah. <laughs> like, so he's he's quite cool. Um, yeah, looks like he's going to be quite magically uh, competent, uh, mm-hmm. according to the notes. Uh, he wears the regalia fulmentaris around his neck, a piece of armor that magnifies his substantial magical abilities. So that's Ooh, uh, that's nice. interesting. And on the the sort of uh, counterpoint to him, we've got Karazai the Scarred. I would, yeah, I'd have gone with Karazai as yeah. well. I love these names. Uh, yeah. So. Karazai is a bit a bit different. Uh, so he has spent ages in the realm of beasts, uh, mm-hmm. and he's been kind of uh, twisted by it. Um, these, from the looks of it, are massive models as well. Um, yeah, from, from they haven't Kansi. really put in the photos. They haven't put uh, like a regular sized infantry next to them just for scale purposes, but. Yeah. I'm, I'm having a look at like sort of the decoration on their basing and the scenery that they've been posed next to, and yes, they look humongous. Yeah, and it, it looks like they are order aligned as well. Um, mm-hmm. They're sort of tied to Sigma uh, and his forces. Uh, so that's that's nice that we're getting some monsters for for the order side because I know they yeah. tend to be a bit more chaosy, chaosy and destructiony mm-hmm. um, for the most part. So. Those are those are some nice uh, minis. What do you think of them in general, Josh? Love them. Fantastic, full of character. Um, like I say, I, I particularly like Crondis uh, because he does have that sort of smug look about him that I I expect a dragon to have. Like, because if you were a dragon, you'd be dead smug about it, right? So it's not intentional, but I'm on the opposite side. I think uh, Karazai is the is the cooler model. Yeah, so we'll post a link in the show notes so that you can check them out yourself. He's all, like, scarred up and beaten up, which is quite cool in its own right. Yeah, I just, I like his, I think his pose is a bit more dynamic. Mm. Um, although, although the poses are quite s- similar, actually, now I'm kind of looking at them. Um, I think it might be the same model. I'm, just, I was uh, just about to say, I I wonder if this is the same plastic kit yeah. that you can you, that you use because the tails look very similar. The tails are similar. Yeah, the torsos this, that, are similar. That's what they've done. That's the same plastic kit, but you've got different parts. I think the fact that Kara's eyes kind of looking off in the direction that his wing is raised makes him mm. look a bit more dynamic to me. Um, just looks like there's a bit more of a, an action pose, whereas as you say. Uh, Krondis just, you know, he looks like he's like, mm, yes. Uh, and he's, he's just being a bit of a douche. Uh, <laughs> hey-ho. But yeah, that's quite cool. Uh, I'm interested to see uh, how they actually shake out uh, when they get yeah. rules and things. Yeah, so again, watch this space, guys, and we'll, uh, uh, we'll keep you up to date on that. And I think on that note, we're a slightly shorter episode than normal. I think I've saved myself five minutes here, so that's that'll be worth it. So <laughs> anyway, as always, guys, thank you very much for listening. And until next time, take care. Bye.